This is the day that the Lord has made. And here we are once again to bring about what the Word of God is saying. Tonight, we are teaching about the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the major prophets. And I pray that you have been blessed with the previous books. As we begin to go into the teachings of the book of Isaiah, I pray that the Holy Spirit will open up your heart to receive what God's word is saying and be a blessing and bring about healing and deliverance where it's needed. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah, whose name means Yahweh is salvation, is the first of the major prophets in the English Bible. The prophet Isaiah is mentioned repeatedly in Second Kings, three times in Second Chronicles, and 16 times in the book of Isaiah itself. The book of Isaiah is dated in the reigns of the Judean kings Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Tradition says that Isaiah was martyred by King Manasseh by being sawn in half at about 680 BC. Thus his period of ministry exceeded 50 years, where King Uzziah died in 740 BC. During this period, the northern kingdom fell and was taken captive by Assyria, as Assyria became a dominant power. But by the end of Isaiah's life, Assyrian power had started to wane. Isaiah's message was that no human power could resist Assyria. So Judah was to look to God for salvation, not to other nations. Isaiah apparently came from an upper-class family in Jerusalem. We are told he was the son of Amos, though we know nothing of his father. Isaiah was educated, he was gifted as a poet and prophet, and gave counsel to kings. Isaiah was married to a prophetess and had two sons. He was also a contemporary of the prophets Hosea and Micah. Some scholars believe that Sir Isaiah the prophet only authored chapters 1 to 39 of the book, and chapters 40 to 66, which appear to address issues pertinent during Persian times, were written about a century and a half later by other authors. But these authors do, typically do not believe in prophetic visions of the future, which are necessary if Isaiah authored the whole book. However, the book has a unity about it, and there's no tradition of multiple authors. The scroll of Isaiah found at Qumran dates to about 150 BC, and is a thousand years older than the previously oldest manuscript known, and did not reveal any material changes in the copying of the scroll over that period. The book of Isaiah is alluded to over 250 times in the New Testament and quoted over 50 times. It's often referred to as the fifth gospel due to its importance to Christianity. The sections of Isaiah. The main dividing line of Isaiah into two sections is seen as chapter 40. So in section 1 we have chapters 1 to 39 which stress judgment on Judah and the other nations. And the second section, chapters 40 to 66, which stress salvation. Section 1 of chapters 1 to 39 then breaks down into four main blocks. A, chapters 1 to 12, which talk about judgment on Judah. B, chapters 13 to 23, which talk about judgment on the surrounding nations. C, chapters 24 to 35, which talk to judgment on all nations. And D, chapters 36 to 39, which is a historical transition between the sections on condemnation and consolation. And it's largely the same as 2 Kings 18 verse 13 to chapters 20 verse 21. Isaiah moves from the specific to the general in chapters 1 to 35. The historical interlude of chapters 36 to 39 depicts the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem in 701 BC. The book does not move forward strictly chronologically. Isaiah's calling is recorded in chapter 6. We will look at chapters 40 to 66 of Isaiah in part 2 of Exploring the Book of Isaiah. Chapter 1. In many ways, chapter 1 of Isaiah summarizes the whole book, condemning Israel but then offering consolation to the remnant. After identifying Isaiah as the prophet, chapter 1 condemns Judah. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Your country is desolate. Your cities burn with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, 
you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares, Ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my head against you. I will thoroughly purge away your droughts and remove all your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in the days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice. Your penitent ones with righteousness, but rebels and sinners will both be broken. And those who forsake the Lord will perish. This is what Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his way so that we may walk in his path. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. God calls Judah to walk with him and enjoy his presence. But Judah is too proud to accept the Lord. Verse 8 continues of chapter 2. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So people will be brought low and everyone humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant will be humbled and human pride brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. The arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols will totally disappear. Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? See now, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, all supplies of food and all supplies of water, the hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the man of rank, the counselor, skilled craftsman and clever enchanter. I will make mere youth their officials, children will rule over them. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old, the nobody against the honored. Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle. The gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute, she will sit on the ground. Chapter 4 introduces the branch of the Lord. The Messiah to come, Jesus Christ in his first and second comings. In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the Lamb will be the pride and glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion who remain in Jerusalem will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem, the Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Then the Lord will create a rule of Mount Zion over those who assemble there, a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over everything the glory will be a canopy. There will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day, and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain. In chapter 5, Isaiah tells of the parable of the vineyard that Jesus echoes in one of his own parables. The vineyard is Israel, and God has provided everything possible for Israel to be righteous and fruitful. But they continually failed, so now God will destroy the vineyard. Therefore, my people will go into exile. For lack of understanding, those of high rank will die of hunger, and the common people will be parched with thirst. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks who acquit the guilty for a bribe, but deny justice to the innocent. Therefore the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. Yet for all this his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. Chapter 6 tells of Isaiah's commissioning. It begins, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, 
high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous. Make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes. Hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Israel and Aram form an alliance against Assyria, but Judah declines to join them. As a result, Aram and Israel attack Judah, and we read in chapter 7. When Ahaz son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah son of Remelia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem. But they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Aram, Ephraim, and Remelia's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tobiel king over it. Yet this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It will not take place, it will not happen. For the head of Amron is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only risen. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Amalia's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, and whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, here now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. Like many prophecies, there was a near-time fulfillment in Isaiah's day of the birth of a son but also a more long-term fulfillment in the birth of Jesus. In chapter 8, God tells Isaiah that he will raise up Assyria to do his calling. He also tells Isaiah, The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Chapter 9 starts with a prophecy of the coming Messiah. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you, as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fueled for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Consular, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatest of, this, of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The rest of chapter 9 returns to an outpouring of God's anger against Israel. Chapter 10 continues, Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? God then says that while he's using Assyria as a tool to punish Israel and Judah, Israel's downfall is also coming. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. When the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. For he says, By the strength of my hand I have done this, and by my wisdom, because I have understanding, I remove the boundaries of nations. I plunder their treasures. Like a mighty one, I subdue their kings. Chapter 10, verse 20 continues. In that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return. A remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. Though your people will be like the sand by the sea, Israel, only a remnant will return. Destruction has been decreed, overwhelming and righteous. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, will carry out the destruction decreed upon the whole land. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. My people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. Very soon my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. But there is always hope with God as he reveals there will be restoration for Israel in chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness to sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw with the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Chapter 12 finishes the first segment of Isaiah with a thanksgiving song of praise, anticipating the reign of the Messiah. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me. Your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. We now turn to the section dealing with judgment on the surrounding nations. Chapter 13 deals with Babylon. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms. The pride and the glory of Babylonians will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or live in through all generations. There are no nomads will pitch their tents. There are no shepherds will rest their flocks. But desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill her houses where the owls will dwell 
and there the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will inhabit her strongholds, jackals, her luxurious palaces. Her time is at hand, and her days will not be prolonged. Chapter 14 continues the judgment against Babylon after a short interlude describing the Messianic kingdom in verses 1 to 3. Verses 12 to 15 are a double prophecy, firstly against the king of Babylon, but also about Lucifer as referenced by Jesus in Luke 10 to 18. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphron. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. The chapter continues with judgments against Assyria, the Philistines and Moab in chapters 15 and 16. Damascus in chapter 17 and Cush in chapter 18. The oracle against Egypt continues in chapter 19. Both Cush, or Ethiopia, and Egypt in chapter 20, and Babylon, Edom, and Arabia in 21. An oracle against Jerusalem follows in chapter 22, before the section concludes with a judgment against Tyre in chapter 23. Chapters 24 to 27 deal with end-time events in the apocalyptic language, speaking of God's judgment against the world for its sin, and of the blessings he has prepared for his people. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for the people, as for the master as for his servant, for the mistress as for her servant, for seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse consumes the earth. His people must bear the guilt. Therefore the earth's inhabitants are burned up and very few are left. In that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. Chapter 25 opens with Isaiah praising God for destroying the wicked before going on in verses 6 to 9. On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheets that cover all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. In that day the song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and rampart. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter. The nation that keeps faith. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord himself is the rock eternal. He humbles those who dwell on high. He lays the lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust. Feet trample it down. The feet of the oppressed, the footsteps of the poor. The path of the righteous is level. You, the upright one, make the way of the righteous smooth. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renewed for the desire of our hearts. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. But when grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. Even in a land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and do not regard the majesty of the Lord. Verse 10 is a warning to us today who live under grace. Do we regard the majesty of the Lord today? Chapter 27 talks to the deliverance of Israel. In that day... Sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. We saw earlier in chapter 5 that the vineyard is Israel. Chapter 27 continues. In days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. By this then will Jacob's guilt be atoned for. And this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin. 
when he makes all the altar stones to be like limestone crushed to pieces. No asher or poles or incense altars will be left standing. In that day the Lord will thresh from the flowing Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt, and you Israel will be gathered up one by one. And in that day a great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. In chapters 28 to 33, Isaiah returns to prophesying about his own day. He refers to the northern kingdom of Israel as Ephraim. Therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. You boast, we have entered into a covenant with death, with the realm of the dead, and we've made an agreement. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us, for we made a lie our refuge and forced our hiding place. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it, it will never be stricken with panic. I will make justice the measuring line and the righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge. The lie and the water will overflow your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be anew. Your agreement with the realm of the dead will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge sweeps by, you will be beaten down by it. Chapter 29 starts, Woe to you, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David settled. Add year to year and let your cycle of festivals go on. Yet I will besiege Ariel. She will mourn and lament. She will be to me like an altar hearth. I will encamp against you on all sides. I will encircle you with towers and set up my siege works against you. Brought low, you will speak from the ground. Your speech will mumble out of the dust. Your voice will come ghost-like from the earth. Out of the dust, your speech will whisper. But the chapter finishes. Therefore, this is what the Lord who redeemed Abraham says to the descendants of Jacob. No longer will Jacob be ashamed. No longer will their faces grow pale. When they see among them their children, the work of my hands, they will keep my name holy. They will acknowledge the holiness of of the Holy One of Jacob, and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Those who are wayward in spirit will gain understanding. Those who complain will accept instruction. In chapters 30 and 31, Isaiah again condemns Judah for seeking the assistance of men. This time Egypt, rather than trusting in God. But again, God offers his grace, saying he will bless Judah, if only they turn back to him. Chapter 32 opens with another vision of the Messianic Kingdom. See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each one will be like a shelter from the wind, and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert, and a shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The fearful heart will know and understand, and a stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. Isaiah again warns about complacency and the things that people trust in cannot give them peace, only trusting in God. The cycle of judgment and rescue by calling to God continues in chapter 33. The opening of the chapter is a reference to Assyria in Isaiah's time, but it is also looking forward to the end times Antichrist. Woe to you, destroyer, you have not been destroyed. Woe to you, betrayer, who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. Verse 2 is the prayer of the righteous. Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in time of distress. The Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. The chapter continues with a picture of the messianic kingdom. The sinners in Zion are terrified, trembling, grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? Those who walk righteously and speak what is right, who reject gain from extortion, and keep their hands from accepting bribes, who stop their ears against plots of murder, and shut their eyes against contemplating evil. They are the ones who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. Their bread will be supplied and water will not fail them. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and a view a land that stretches afar. Look on Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful abode, a tent that will not be moved. Its stakes will never be pulled up nor any of its ropes broken. There the Lord will be our mighty one. It will be like a place of broad rivers and streams. No galley with oars will ride them. No mighty ship will sail them. 
For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. Your rigging hangs loose. The mast is not held secure. The sail is not spread. Then an abundance of spoils will be divided. And even the lame will carry off plunder. No one living in Zion will say I'm ill. And the sins of those who dwell there will be forgiven. Chapter 34 continues with the judgments against all nations at the end of time. The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is on all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. All the stars in the sky will be dissolved and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution to uphold Zion's cause. Chapter 35 then goes on to talk about God's redemption. The desert and the parched land will be glad, the wilderness rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus it will burst into bloom, it will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunt where jackals once lay, grass and weeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. The wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any rivers beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Chapters 36 to 39 tell the stories of Sennacherib attacking Jerusalem, Hezekiah's repentance and prayer, and God delivering Jerusalem from the Assyrians, followed by Hezekiah's sickness and recovery that is mentioned in Second Kings. Although Isaiah 38, 9-20 is a prayer by Hezekiah that is not in Second Kings, and then the visit by the Babylonian envoys in chapters 39. Conclusion of part 1 of Isaiah. While chapters 1 to 39 are considered the chapters of condemnation in Isaiah, they still contain great passages of hope. Isaiah retains the theme of the prophets that God does not want a show of holiness. He wants the real thing. Israel was condemned for going through the motions of worship. We are subject to the same judgment today. The chapters of universal judgment are hard reading, and yet are the result of man trusting in man, and not trusting in God. Yet even in these times, God shows grace. Return to me and be blessed, he says again and again. It's never too late to return to God. And Isaiah shows us glimpses of the Messiah in his first coming, and in the second. Isaiah's message is that those firmly planted in the righteousness of God need have no worries for what the future holds. The question is, which category do we fall into? Those who will be condemned or those who will be consoled? And the answer to that is, what is our relationship to the Messiah? Jesus Christ. And so if you want to avoid the judgments of the end times, you need to be under the blood of Jesus Christ to recognize the Messiah and to worship in spirit and in truth, just as Jesus said to the Samaritan woman. And how do we do that? First of all, we must accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we can do that easily by just praying a very simple prayer, which means that we repent of our sin and we turn from it, which means that not just that we're sorry for our sin because we got caught out, are we going to do the same thing, hoping that uh, we won't be found out again? No, repentance means that we're going to say we're sorry for it and turn away to never intentionally repeat it. Now, sometimes that we do things again, and that's where First John 1 John 1.9 tells us that uh, if we confess our sins, then God is just and righteous and will forgive us our sin. So we have to repent of our sins and we have to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour of our lives and believe in our heart that Jesus raised him from the dead. And then that will bring us into the kingdom of God. Once we pray this prayer, then we should seek out a church that preaches the word of God. And Jesus also told us that we should be baptized. I mean, normally we, we start by being baptized in water. But then as we continue to grow in the things of God, we should be looking to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And so let us just pray this very simple prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you as a sinner. I am sorry I repent of the things that I have done that have not been pleasing to you. I seek to please you now, and so I turn from my wicked ways, and I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. 
I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead on the third day, and I confess with my mouth that he's now my Lord and Savior. And so, Father God, I give you thanks that by praying this prayer, I have now become a member of the kingdom of God. And I pray that I'll continue to walk with you. I will seek your ways through understanding, through reading the Bible and with prayer. And I give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. I would like to say that in the teachings of the book of Isaiah, what is mindful and very attentive in my spirit is where Isaiah himself, he was a well-educated man in those days. And besides being well-educated, today we will call him well-positioned financially. What God had choose to use him when he realized within himself that in spite of how well educated he was and the natural um, blessings and riches that he has, that he was a man of unclean lips. And God is a God. He meets us at the point of our need. And no matter who you are, that's the God that we serve. He's God of provision. And he looks at the heart. And although Isaiah had questioned or even declare, you know, I'm not able to fulfill what you're calling me to do, Lord. Lord has said, yes, you are. And that's when he fully understand that no matter what he, he had accomplished, and I would use the definition as a leader, realizing that if he, if he believed that he accomplished his goal and where God was not the ultimate goal of his accomplishment, he missed out on a whole lot in life. He used the excuse of not being able to do this and do that. And it's a process that God had took him through to realize, in spite of what you believe, but you have accomplished that, you have accomplished everything you really haven't. Because the ultimate goal is to be used for God's glory. And it's amazing how God had answered his question, who am I? God saying, yes, you are the one I, I choose to use because a lot of people look up to you. And even today, it doesn't matter the universities, the theology that you have accomplished and all the other things in, in the, the seminaries. The underlying truth is your heart has to be in line with God's will. Your accomplishment, the ultimate goal is for God's glory, not for yours. Of being mindful that, yes, God has provided you accomplish those things, but what next? Is it just for your personal gain? Or was it for me to be exalted among the earth above everything and everyone else? Was it for me that the people will see me in you in everything you do and say? I truly believe that Isaiah had learned that. And uh, when he had come to the full knowledge of what God has said to him and declared, I was, was not accepting any excuses from him. I truly believe that he was humble in heart and to receive God's instructions, his mandates, and the purpose he was created and to bring glory and honor to his name. And a vessel, we call it in our time, the vessel of honor, a vessel of recognition, a vessel of fame. But is that all? God is looking for more. God is looking for uh, a humble person, man or woman, who not only just caught up in what they believe that what they have accomplished is that's the end of it. God is looking for vessels that wants nothing less than to bring glory on him. They want everything to bring glory and honor to Jehovah. Because all the talents and the gifts that God has put into them, all the potentials, God created it. So he alone to be exalted in the earth, throughout the earth, and using us as a channel. So those that are searching to find him, our great God, our mighty God, our sovereign God, who cares about their well-being, who is concerned about everything that they're going through. And again, God is a God of provision. So he, if he can use Isaiah, a major prophet, well-educated man in those days, what about us today? It doesn't mind the credentials that you have. All God wants is your heart. And that's all that matters. And I pray that the teachings of the book of Isaiah will be a lesson to all of us today, especially those in the position of strategic places of impact and influence here on this earth because there's only a time and a season that we have the work to get done 
and after that the judgment and as we were we were attentive and listening to the book of Isaiah and what God is saying and the ultimate goal he said yes I realize what you you have done you have turned your back on me but yet I am a forgiving God I'm a God of a second chance I'm a God who wants to heal and deliver you and to restore you at the position back where you should be in my kingdom only what's done for Christ will last everything else is vanity and we give God thanks and praise honor and glory for searching deep within us in our spirit and surfacing what needs to be evaluated surfacing what needs to be brought forth so we realize that everything that we have is from him and have to do great exploits for him and him alone and we thank him we give him honor and we give him praise because even in the book of Isaiah there's a mention also of the coming of Jesus Christ where there was a sacrificial death for all of us and because of God's love for all of us and the importance is to be an available vessel for his honor and for his glory and i thank God for his holy spirit is the one who always available to give us a clear understanding of our calling our gifting where we truly make the difference and an impact in people's lives so we will be a bridge used as a bridge as they make their way back into the kingdom of god in jesus mighty name amen amen